behalf of Writers Block Presents LA and the Beverly Hills Bar Association, I want to thank you for being here tonight. I'm Belinda McCauley. I'm the executive director of BHBA and uh, am just personally so inspired and looking forward to this conversation tonight between these two leaders on the gun violence prevention issue and uh, two great authors now as well. Um, I think everybody has a, a moment about Sandy Hook. Um, I grew up visiting my family in Newtown, Connecticut, and uh, we'll never forget the feeling of watching the breaking news on the internet and then on TV. I was very pregnant with my now eight-year-old daughter, our only child, who has now been doing active shooter drills in school since she was three years old because of the events of that day. Um, and one of my defining memories from that time is the voice of our main speaker here tonight, Senator Chris Murphy, then Senator-elect Murphy. His um, sadness and anger and um, motivation to change, I think, spoke for so many people in those horrifying um, hours and days following the events there. And um, he has, as he details in the book, his evolution on this issue um, it was before so many of us. And um, just really look forward to hearing more about that tonight. And Shannon Watts uh, had a, I think, uh, similarly galvanizing moment as a mom with Sandy Hook, although hers was much more effective. Um, she created a Facebook group that uh, the day after the massacre, and she has now grown that into the largest um, advocacy group in the country on gun issues. And yes, that means bigger than the NRA. And uh, that journey has also just been um, incredible to watch. So can't thank enough um, both of them for being here tonight. I'm going to turn it over now to Andrea Grossman, the, the founder and the fearless leader of Writer's Block Presents, who's going to tell you more about these fantastic books and uh, then turn it over for um, what I think is just going to be an amazing conversation. Thanks so much, Belinda. I'm so delighted that the Beverly Hills Bar and Writer's Block could present this program together. And thanks to all of you for coming to today's program with Senator Chris Murphy and Shannon Watts. We've got to talk about guns. We've got to do something about curbing mass shootings that are a daily occurrence across this country. Senator Murphy is the most outspoken member of Congress on gun violence, and he has been for years since Sandy Hook. Since he's joined the Senate, his name is synonymous with the national movement to enact sensible gun laws. Why is this such a struggle? Why does the question of sensible gun laws become a partisan issue? In his utterly terrific book, I love this book, The Violence Inside Us, Senator Murphy starts with Sandy Hook, but takes us deep into our uniquely American fascination with and crazy love for guns. He explores the nature of violence and the ease with which Americans more than anyone else can act on these impulses. Murphy gives us story after story and example after example of how and why America just tops all lists with gun ownership, mass shootings, and lax regulation. This is not a wonky book at all. It's a living testimony, a personal and fiery book for anyone who lives in a city or a suburb where anyone can seemingly open fire. Shannon Watts is an unstoppable force in the gun violence prevention movement. She's the founder of Moms Demand Action, a grassroots group that took on the NRA, Congress, governors, and amassed a membership of millions of people. Their goal is simple, to educate and activate the public about gun violence and gun safety. Her book, Fight Like a Mother is a primer for changing the world through activism. It's a handbook for stirring us from numbness at the latest round of bullets into moving us into action. Please visit our website and find the link to Chevalier's to get these books. You might have questions. You can email them to us at reservations at writersblockpresents.com and we'll try to address them. Uh, Shannon has received a bunch of questions that have already been emailed in, so we'll do what we can, and I'm so looking forward to this. Uh, thank you very much and delighted to introduce Senator Chris Murphy and Shannon Waz. Thank you so much, Andrea. Senator, thank you so much for joining me tonight. It's great to have this discussion with you, and you know, I was just thinking about I, it's amazing to me that I've been doing this now for eight and a half years, but the first time I met you, I was living in Indiana where I started Moms Demon Action. It was Valentine's Day and 
we decided it would be a really good idea for all of our volunteers to send thousands of, of Valentines to a PO box in DC, where we would get them, sort through them, and then try to figure out how to smuggle them in to the Capitol, not realizing that you couldn't do that. And uh, I remember going to your office and first of all, meeting with your staff. And what the, your staff had done was to make Valentine's back to Moms Demand Action volunteers. We were trying to get senators to vote at the time for, for something called Mansion to Me, which I'm sure we'll talk more about. Um, but, but I remember meeting you and just, you know, you were still reeling just two months after uh, the devastating tragedy. Uh, in, in Newtown, Connecticut. And you have been a champion on this issue now for over, you know, eight years too, um, since you've been in office. And so th there's a lot to talk about, but, but I think where people probably want us to start is not the beginning, but a little bit about the end, because you have been working around the clock. I know you've been negotiating a deal on background checks or trying to, and, and I'm just wondering if you'd mind giving everyone an update on, on where things stand. Uh, well, uh, of course, and, and let me start out by uh, thanking Writers Block uh, and the Beverly Hills Bar for co-hosting this event. Great to be with you, even though it's uh, virtually. Um, for those that are watching, uh, Shannon and I are, um, you know, both uh, in this movement together, but but also friends. And it's great to be with you, uh, Shannon. Um, uh, and I hope that we get a chance to, you know, talk about the journeys that both of us have uh, been on. Obviously, you and I share so much in common. Um, uh, both of our lives were transformed that day and the rest of our lives since December in 2012, um, you know, really can be, be, be told um, through and by that transformation. Um, but sure, let's sort of skip ahead uh, <laughs> because this is sort of the here and now and Mom's Man Action has been very intimately involved in, you know, all of the work we're trying to do to find the 60 votes for the time being that we need to pass an anti-gun violence measure through the Senate. Um, you know, I, I sent this out on social media this weekend. Um, we should just remember for a second how stunning it is that we can have a policy like universal background checks. This is the idea that wherever you buy a gun, you should have to prove that you're not a criminal or you don't have a serious history of mental illness. We have a policy, universal background checks, that's supported by 90% of the American public the President of the United States, the majority of the Senate, and the majority of the House. And we can't get it done. We can't get it done because the Byzantine rules of the Senate require you to get 60 votes instead of 50 votes. And so we have been, for the better part of this year, on this search to try to find a compromise proposal um, that is less than universal background checks, which is supported by 90% of the American public, that can get those 10 Republican votes to pair with 50 Democratic votes that would mean passage through the Senate. Uh, the House has already passed universal background checks. Um, I have, um, as Shannon knows, I've been in negotiations for much of this year with a Senator from uh, Texas, John Cornyn, uh, to try to find that compromise proposal. Um, I, I will unfortunately tell you that we were not able to sort of come up with an idea that moved the needle in a substantial and meaningful way. So about two weeks ago, those negotiations ended. Um, but there are other partners. Uh, right now, I'm working on a different proposal with Senator Lindsey Graham uh, and Senator Pat Toomey. Uh, again, it'll be a proposal that'll be deeply unsatisfactory because it won't be universal background checks, but uh, it potentially could be um, an expansion of background checks that would save a whole lot of lives in this country. It's not a coincidence that you know, Connecticut with universal background checks uh, has 200%, 240% less gun crime than a state like Florida that doesn't have universal background checks. States that have universal background checks have lower rates of gun crime. So, you know, initially I thought that we were going to probably be targeting June for a vote in the Senate. That is still a possibility, but it now looks more likely that we'll give these latest negotiations a little bit more time. And at some point over the summer, the Senate will consider a background checks measure. We're not going to, um, you know, negotiate forever with Republicans. At some point, we have to call their bluff. So at some point, I think Senator Schumer, the majority leader in the Senate, will call the question. And if I can't get a compromise worked out ahead of time that has 60 votes, he'll bring up you know, some version of, uh, of, of 
uh, expanded background checks, very close to universal, if not universal. We'll put it up on the Senate floor and we'll see how many Republican votes it gets. So um, we're still negotiating. Uh, hopefully good news to report, but we're definitely taking a vote on this in the Senate one way or the other, and that probably will happen pretty soon. And Senator, the point of that on, on background checks or frankly any gun safety bill, including the Violence Against Women Act or red flag laws or the Charleston loophole, the, the point of the vote, if they won't continue to negotiate, is really to get people on record going into the midterm elections? Yeah, listen, there's a reason why Mitch McConnell refused to have a vote on background checks from 2016 uh, until the end of his time as majority leader. That was sort of coincidental to the period of time, I would argue, where the power of the two movements flipped. So, you know, Moms Demand Action and Giffords and all these groups start up. Uh, after the Sandy Hook shooting. They're joined in 2019 by the kids, by uh, the groups that come out of Parkland. And, um, you know, by 2020, by 2019, 2020, the power now has shifted. The NRA is declining in power. Our movement has more volunteers, more money. So McConnell just doesn't want to have a vote on background checks because he's worried. He's worried that it will pass. Um, there are a lot of Republicans that I, I think are uncertain about what their votes will be. I think it's hard to get 60 votes on a universal background checks bill, but I also know there's a lot of Republicans that are not looking forward to casting that vote with the NRA because they are not going to get the kind of political backup that the NRA used to be able to offer, and they're going to have a whole mess of really angry constituents in a way that wouldn't have happened and didn't happen, frankly, back in 2013. So yes, I think we're, we want to take a vote, A, to get people on the record so that we can organize around that vote come election time, but also because we're not sure how that vote will play out. We think there are some Republicans that have been kind of hiding behind Mitch McConnell for the last five years that might consider uh, voting yes if we actually force them to choose between the declining power of the gun lobby, the increasing power of the anti-gun violence movement, and the unquestionable evidence that says, if you pass this, you are gonna save lives. Yes. Um, so that's the reason to try to force a, a vote. So you were just talking about how the, the movements have grown. So let's now go back to the beginning. Um, there was a section in your book that that I really appreciated. Um, you know, it 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 was it was about how we join this movement in the wake of of the the horrific Sandy Hook school shooting tragedy. And and you know, you talked in your book about what you had learned and what you've learned from other activists. And now that you've been in this fight, you know, seeing that they have really been on the front line for decades. And I, I appreciated your perspective and just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that along your journey. Yeah, sure. I mean, listen, I, um, you know, I talk in the book pretty honestly about um, my embarrassment. Um, you know, my embarrassment as somebody who was in politics for a long time before 2012, as you said, I was elected to the Senate that year, but I'd been in Congress for six years. I'd been in the state legislature for eight years. Uh, and I hadn't worked on this issue, despite the fact that kids were getting killed, you know, right down the street from me in Hartford, Connecticut, New Haven, Connecticut on a regular basis. Um, you know, like a lot of the rest of the country, I woke up after Sandy Hook, but, um, you know, the most devastating moment for me in many ways was a couple of weeks after Sandy Hook, I went to a community center in the north end of Hartford. And I tell the story in detail in the book. And I was confronted by the parents there who had, you know, been losing kids regularly in the low income neighborhoods of the capital of Connecticut. And they said, where have you been? They're like, we grieve harder than anybody else for what happened in Sandy Hook because we know what it feels like to lose a child. But why did it take the murder of 20 white children for this country to all of a sudden start paying attention to what's been happening to black children? for decades. Um, and so I feel like I've been making up for lost time uh, since then. Um, but you're right that we sort of learn lessons about political action and we learn lessons about what's effective. I think what's most effective is when sort of these movements join, when the parents of uh, the kids who have been lost in our cities, who are largely parents of color, join together with parents from the suburbs who have been activated, whose parent, whose kids are going through these active shooter drills. So our movement is most effective when these um, two forces are, are, are joined. Um, and then what I've also learned is that, um, you know, persistence just 
really matters um, in this uh, in this movement because that's what the gun lobby had forever. It's just when you took a vote against the gun lobby, you knew that there was just going to be a ton of phone calls into the office. You knew that the next time you had a town hall, all the gun rights people were going to flood the town hall. And for decades, members of Congress just said, I don't want that aggravation. Maybe I want to vote for universal background checks, but I just don't want to have to put up with that. So we're building the same machine now. And so we need to keep it up because every single time that we're flooding members offices with phone calls, asking them to vote for universal background checks, it's a reminder to them that if they vote the wrong way, now it's us they're going to have to deal with. We're going to be the ones that are packing their town halls. We're going to be the ones that are knocking on their district office doors. So what I've learned is that um, persistence sort of pays off, but it's a long-term investment because the NRA had 20 years to sort of make people scared of their movement. We need to sort of have faith that even though there may be a whole bunch of, of, of losses and setbacks over time, people are going to start to think about us, what for decades they thought about the gun lobby. So it's that, it's, it's that stick to that that our movement needs. I actually think that is such an important point because you know, sometimes people get frustrated with incrementalism. And, and I'm not even sure that's the right term for it, right? It's just the steady drips on a rock that causes change in this country. It's the way the system is set up. I wish we could have changed everything overnight a long time ago. But activism on any issue really requires showing up over and over and over again. And if you go back to 2008, when Barack Obama was elected president, about a quarter of all Democrats in the Senate had A ratings from the NRA. And, you know, you were just talking about the calls that go into offices. I remember Senator Heidi Heitkamp, who is no longer in office. She said the reason she voted against Mansion Toomey, a bill that would have closed the background check loophole uh, in honor of the Sandy Hook school shooting tragedy. She said she voted against it because she had more calls from the other side. Whether that's true, I don't know. But, but at the, at the end of the day, you have to build a movement that can go toe to toe with whatever special interest that you're up against. And I think it's really important. You know, I, I'm sure you get this question. I get it a lot. You know, aren't you dejected? Aren't you depressed? Aren't you hopeless? Aren't you cynical? I am none of those things. I am eight and a half years into what may take a long time to finally get all the work we need to get done done. You know, in my mind, I don't know who else is better cut out to do that kind of work than than moms, <laughs> because, you know, you have no choice but to keep going when things get tough. But I mean, is that your perspective of this as well? Well, it, it, it is. Um, and, you know, what I know as a student of history is that, um, <laughs> you know, no great social change movement succeeded in the first five years. In fact, the great social change movements that you read about in the history books met setback after setback after setback, but they were so convinced of the righteousness of their cause that they kept going. The, the, the social change movements that you don't read about in the history books are the ones that started up, hit a few speed bumps, and packed it up and went home. Yeah. So we need to remember that that's what we are. We're a great social change movement in the history of the civil rights movement and the marriage equality movement. Um, we also, and you do a really good job of talking about this, uh, Shannon, is, is we also need to remind people that we've had success, yeah. right? You just passed, Moms Man Action helped lead the passage of legislation in Maryland um, just uh, this year, right? That, yep. that, that sort of now uh, puts Maryland on the list of those with universal background checks. We passed universal background checks in Nevada. We got a referendum passed in Washington State, uh, Connecticut, in the wake of Sandy Hook, did pass legislation that's saving people's lives. And so, you know, we have um, we have had a lot of successes already. Um, and you're right, this issue now becoming a litmus test of sorts in the Democratic Party um, is a success. The fact that I have multiple potential partners on a background checks bill is also a sign of success. Now, are we to 60 votes? I don't know. But back in 2013, there was only one single Republican that was willing to talk yep. about a compromise. Pat Toomey, that was it. So now I've got three or four Republicans that are willing to put their name on a compromise. So I get it that people sort of want this to happen faster. Um, but, you know, the Brady bill, the, the bill that, that sort of sets up the universal background checks system in 1993, um, passed 12 years after yep. Jim Brady was shot. 
So we unfortunately have a history of having to work for a decade before we get life saving change here. And, um, you know, listen, when it comes to life and death, um, I don't know, I'll put in as much work as it takes. I mean, this is about saving kids lives. And so I don't see any reason to pack it up and go home until people see the light on this. Which and, and and a lot of the reason we've made so pro- much progress is because you have made that commitment and and I have these numbers at my fingertips because I say them many times a day. But we've passed background checks now in 21 states. We've closed the Charleston loophole now in 19 states. We've passed red flag laws now in 19 states. We've passed laws to disarm domestic abusers now in 29 states. We've stopped the NRA's agenda year after year for the last five years. 90% of the time in state houses, changed hundreds of corporate policies. Right? That's all change that never would have been made if it hadn't been for this movement. I want to go back uh, just for a minute and and talk a little bit about, you know, the the bubble that you and I and so many white gun violence prevention advocates lived in really before we joined this movement. And and you talked a little bit about that bubble and and how you make sure that your advocacy is reflective of of the daily toll that gun violence takes. Um, 100 Americans every single day, 200 more wounded. And, and maybe you could could do that when talking about the description of the school lockdown drill that you experienced in Baltimore. And, and maybe just tell people about that and, and how that has influenced your approach to gun safety. Yeah, um, you know, Shannon, and I, in this book, I you know try to do a lot of storytelling because I've just found in my career that that's the sort of best way to move an audience. And it's also, you know, I think the most interesting from a reader's perspective. Um, this um, this was a pretty heartbreaking and extraordinary experience that I had um, uh, in uh, 2018, 2019, I forget, but it was over the winter. Um, I went up to Baltimore on a sort of a fact-finding trip. I had heard about an after-school program uh, in a real low-income, high-violence neighborhood that was, you know, helping give sort of kids a pathway out of this cycle of violence that was happening in Baltimore, a city that on many years in the last five has the highest rate of homicide in the nation. So I went up there, I got there, um, you know, around nine o'clock in the morning, um, uh, 9.30, went to, to a classroom on the second floor of the school to sort of get a summary of the program. And in the middle of this summary, the lights go out and a horn blasts and a voice comes over the intercom. Uh, code green, code green, code green. And um, the um, uh, person we were with uh, was not a sort of teacher at the school. So she called down to the intercom to ask what a code green is and what we should do. We come to find out that a code green is what happens when there's been an active shooting in the neighborhood within blocks of the school. And the school was going into lockdown. So we waited for a while and uh, half an hour later, the intercom said Code Green lifted and we went on with our sort of our our day. Um, So uh, when I left the school, um, you know, I wanted to find out what happened. And so um, I I did my research and I found out um, that uh, this young man by the name of Corey Dodd uh, had dropped off his twin girls at that school that very morning. He drove two blocks to back to his house. He walked out of his car and he was shot dead. Mm-hmm. There were two girls in that school, second graders, I think, who were probably giggling during that code green, thinking that they you know, had a little bit of time away from instruction, not knowing that their dad was dead on their doorstep. And, and, and what we, the two things to me that I sort of walked away from that experience with are, are, are one, um, those girls' lives were fundamentally changed. But think about all the other kids in that school who you know, have to come to terms with the fact that parents at that school die after they drop off their daughters and sons. How many other kids in that school are now worrying every single day, is that going to happen to my dad? Is that going to happen to my mom? What we know is that kids who grow up in these violent neighborhoods, they experience rates of PTSD that are comparable to our soldiers when they go to Iraq and Afghanistan. We're losing an entire generation of kids because even if their parent hasn't been shot, even if they've never been shot, they grow up so traumatized by the fear of gun violence that they can't learn. It's not a coincidence that the underperforming schools in this country are all in the violent neighborhoods. The second thing, Shannon, though, that I thought about was that I had to search really hard to find out anything about Corey Dodd. There was one article in the paper, um, in one of the Baltimore papers the next day, 
nothing for the rest of the week. I had to search to find out who he was, what his story was. And I thought to myself, what if that happened in Westport, Connecticut? What if that happened in a Tony suburb in my state filled with white parents and white kids? What if a, a, a you know, insurance company executive had dropped his two twin daughters off at a white school and when he went home, got shot on his front doorstep? That would be national news. That would be all over CNN that night. That would be a story that dominated coverage in Connecticut. Why? Because it was a white parent, because he dropped off white kids, but because it happened in Baltimore and was a black guy and it was black children, it didn't even make news in Baltimore that day. And that just shows you how much more we value white life than black life. And it, it couldn't have been starker to me that day. So the, the trauma that is visited upon kids and the, the different valuations that we put on life, you have to sort of have those conversations. And that story that I tell in detail in the book, you know, hammered that home for me. Senator, you were just talking about news and, and, and whether these shootings and gun violence makes the headlines. And I get asked all the time if we are numb. Right. You were talking about how so much gun violence doesn't make the headlines, but it almost seems like these days there has to be a certain number in the body count in order for it to even make the Chiron. Right. I mean, it, it does seem like our media are frustrated with telling the story over and over again in a country where if you divide 100 by four. You know, you have 25 mass shootings essentially every single day. What do you say when people say, do you think Americans are becoming numb? Well, I um, I sort of amplified something that you posted last weekend. You noted um, on your social media feed that on, I think, Friday and Saturday, there were three mass shootings in the United States where 32 people were shot. Um, and, and, and as you mentioned, it barely got noticed. Mm -hmm. Three mass shootings, 32 people shot. Um, I'll be honest, Shannon. I mean, I, I worry that we are getting numb to this. Uh, I mean, I worry that... Um, that people now expect this pace of slaughter and kind of expect Congress to let it happen. And I, I refuse to let that become normal. Um, but it is difficult to sort of muster the emotional energy to show outrage weekend after weekend, day after day. Um, and I will tell you, though, that, you know, this is how sort of civil societies fall apart. Yes. When you become OK with this level of mass violence and atrocity, I don't want to make sort of out of school comparisons here, but there are plenty to societies that devolved into yes. mass violence because the society sort of wasn't OK with it but just lost their sense of outrage. So I don't know. I mean, I guess I sort of turn this around to you in some ways because <laughs> I, I'm searching for this, this answer of how we maintain our, 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 our sort of sense of morality, our sense of grounding as to what's right and wrong and how we yeah. sort of make people understand that, um, you know, this doesn't happen anywhere else. This doesn't happen no, I, anywhere else except for the United States. So I don't know. Do you yep. worry about this? I mean, when you said that part about, societies sort of becoming used to it, you know, gave me goosebumps because I, I think that is something we should all be afraid of. And certainly you're not numb and I'm not numb. And, and how can we ever become numb as a country to 100 Americans shot and killed every single day? And yet, is there some level of trauma that we all have, right? Something like one in three Americans have been exposed to gun violence, gun suicide, gun homicide, domestic gun violence, unintentional shooting. And I think that's why it's so important that everyone does get off the sidelines because there is strength in numbers and because we have to continue to show that we will not tolerate a society in which we have let um, a, a gun lobby write our nation's gun laws. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because so many of our volunteers come into our organization, yes, after horrific mass shooting tragedies or, or gun violence in their family or their community, but so often when they send their kindergartner to school for the first time, and they have to essentially rehearse their deaths in the bathroom of their kindergarten school classroom as though that piece of wood is going to protect them from the spray of an AR-15. And I can't tell you how many survivors have said to me, I really wish I would have gotten involved in this issue before it came to my doorstep. 
And so I guess that that is what I would say to people who wonder if they are numb or if other people are numb, which is we can't afford to be numb because any of us could be impacted at any time. And, and I do want to shift gears a little bit and just talk about the Second Amendment, right? Uh, you know, their gun extremists are always painting those of us who are working on this issue as being against the Second Amendment. Uh, but, you know, gun owners actually support policies like background checks on every gun sale. They don't view it as a threat to their Second Amendment rights. Many Moms Demand Action volunteers or their partners are, are gun owners. Um, you write yourself in your book, guns were built into the fabric of early America, but so was the heavy regulation of these weapons. So can you talk a little bit about how we've gotten to this point where everything has been turned so upside down? Yeah, I do. I spend a little time in the book sort of doing a, a primer on the Second Amendment, because I think this is often, you know, where, um, you know, our friends get a, get a little shy um, because, you know, folks aren't sort of comfortable having the debate at the, you know, Thanksgiving dinner table with their uncle who sat, seems like he knows everything about the Second Amendment and gun rights. Um, but the sort of story is, you know, not that complicated. Um, you know, I, I talk about how, as you mentioned in the book, um, you know, early America, you know, did, uh, have a deep connection with the firearm. It is true that the, you know, uh, revolution started because the British were sort of coming to seize the colonists weapons. Um, and so I do come to the conclusion that there is likely a common law right in the United States to private gun ownership. Um, but it is also true that there were massive amounts of gun regulation at the founding uh, of America. At the time the Second Amendment was being written, there were restrictions on who could own a weapon, who couldn't own a weapon. There were requirements that you register your weapon and your gunpowder. There were restrictions on where you could carry your weapon and where you couldn't carry your weapon. Frankly, all the things we're talking about today that extremists will tell you violate the Second Amendment were in place in states all across America when the Second Amendment was being written. So it is perfectly within the confines of the Second Amendment uh, to regulate that right. Um, and I just think we have to be very comfortable in that space. I think the gun um, anti-gun violence movement would be wise to just say, hey, we believe the Second Amendment protects the right of private gun ownership, but we believe that you can regulate that uh, that right. And to your point, you know, this is a space where tons of gun owners live. Um, I tell a version of the story in the book, but it happened again to me just two weeks ago. I was at the airport in Hartford and I was waiting for my ride uh, and a guy sort of sees me across the baggage claim area and he sort of marches over to me and he's like, you're Chris Murphy. And I said, I'm Chris Murphy. He's like, he's like, well, I'm a gun owner um, and I don't like what you're doing to us. And I said, oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, uh, and he said sort of something else to, to me, derogatory. And I said, but let me ask you this. What do you think about background checks? Do you think everybody should go through a background check before they buy a gun? And he says, well, yeah, I'm for that. I'm for that. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you trying to take my guns. And I said, well, you know, that that's what people tell you I want to do. But that's actually not what I'm pushing right now. Right now, all I want to do is require everybody to go through a background check. And he said, OK, well, fine. That I'm for. Uh, and this happens over and over and over again. The thing that we're arguing about in Washington is supported by 90 percent of gun owners out there. And, and this mythology that the secret agenda of, you know, Shannon Watts and Chris Murphy is to take everybody's guns is just not true. We just want to make sure that the right people own guns and that the wrong people don't, because we know that if we pass those kind of laws, um, we'll save a whole lot of lives. We don't have to go out and confiscate guns. I don't want to do that. I don't think it's legal to do that. And I also we don't, don't have think the time to do that. And I don't think it's necessary. You know, the, the other common refrain you hear is that the, the problem isn't guns. It's actually mental illness. And, you know, I share your frustration with blaming skyrocketing gun violence rates on mental illness. We know that, that people who are mentally ill are much more likely to be victims of violent crime than perpetrators. So could you expand a little bit about why you think this, this trope has continued? Well, I, I think it's a convenient one that allows for the gun industry to keep on selling weapons because they just tell people it's not the weapons, it's mental illness. It's just 100% false. Um, there is no, I mean, I guess what is most persuasive to me is that there is no evidence that America has more mental illness than any other high-income country in the world, because we don't. 
Um, but all the gun violence is in the United States. None of it is in France or Japan or Korea, countries that have the same rate of mental illness that the United States does. So clearly it can't be mental illness that explains our gun violence epidemic. Um, what is different about America from those countries is that people who are having a sort of mental break have easy access to yes. a weapon. Um, and, and so it is that it is that access to the weapon that makes the difference. It is also just not true that every mass shooter is mentally ill. And I know that's kind of hard to believe. People say, well, you have to be mentally ill in order to you know, shoot randomly into a school or a movie theater. That's actually not true. There's a lot of things that can be going on in your brain that are not connected to a diagnosable mental illness. In fact, there is no evidence that Adam Lanza had a diagnosable mental illness. Um, and so I talk a little bit about this in the book, how there's this sort of very disturbing concoction of pathologies, in, in, including narcissism um, and, and other maladies that end up convincing these young men to carry out these horrific crimes. But in the minority of cases, when, just talking about mass shooters, is there any evidence any evidence that there was a mental illness uh, involved. So I just think we have to be accurate when we talk about this. And then we also have to recognize that, you know, this is really about the gun industry trying to absolve themselves of, uh, of, of responsibility. You know, there's so much we could talk about. Um, and, and I do want to make sure where we get to audience questions, but is there anything that you and I haven't really covered or, or anything, you know, that you wanted to share that was surprising that you learned while researching your book? Well, I'll say this. The one thing that was surprising to me, and I talk about this to my colleagues a lot, is I spent a lot of time sort of researching the uh, sort of history of violence in America. Um, and there's just no way to tell the story of violence in America without doing it through the prism of, of race. Um, and, and I think we talked a little bit about that, how you have to talk about race when you talk about violence. Um, but, you know, it's not a coincidence that America... Um, becomes a violence outlier globally in the 1840s and the 1850s. That is the period of time where the slave population exp mm. expands, explodes in the United States. And it's during that time that America requires this just epidemic level of violence in the South in order to keep, you know, a million plus people enslaved. And the whole country sort of becomes anesthetized, becomes numb to violence because it's how we order the entire economy. You talked about the fact that we're numb today. Well, we were numb way back because violence was the way that we kept the slave population under thumb. It then became the way in which we kept African-Americans from exerting too much influence and power in the South once they were freed from slavery. Violence has always been a way in which sort of the white majority has oppressed uh, the black minority. And you have to sort of understand that in order to sort of understand why violence happens today. The other thing you learn is that there are these two moments in American history where gun violence rates fall off a cliff. Um, and it is not coincidental to the two most significant anti-gun violence laws passed by Congress. So in the 1930s, Congress passes the first laws regulating guns and immediately gun murder rates plummet. Then they continue to rise and rise and rise until the 1990s, uh, when Congress passes the second most important set of gun violence measures, the background checks bill and the assault weapons ban. And right after those measures are passed, bam, gun violence rates comes down. So it's just proof that laws matter in this country. And while our rates have always been high, they're the lowest compared to the rest of the world after Congress gets serious about attacking the problem. Those are the two sort of things to me that were most fascinating in the research uh, for the book. It, it's so interesting that that we just brought it full circle, you know, this idea of Americans tolerating this kind of violence and it's preventable, it's senseless, and it's, to your point, stoppable. Right. Yeah, it is. It, and, and it is. And we see that on a state by state basis. We talked about the difference in yeah. murder rates between states that have universal background checks and those that don't. And then if you look at the broad history of American violence, you also see that the big interventions at the federal level have an immediate impact. And that's what I believe will happen if we pass, you know, something significant again, you know, uh, in Congress. Senator, we're going to go to the audience, but I, I, I want to make sure we let people know how they can 
watch us and then and then it help enact change and keep all of our families safe. What do you think that is is a good recommendation for people watching us about how they can help move the needle on gun safety federally or or in their state? Well, I'm talking to the solution right now. So um, thank you for allowing me to do a a, a PSA for uh, for, for moms. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, man, when you started, I, I mean, I tell, uh, I, I'll, I'll say I tell sort of the, 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 the snippet of the story of, of Shannon's um, uh, movement in the book, because um, it is true that Moms of Man Action has become, um, you know, the most forceful organization for change. Uh, and so I would hope that anybody that is motivated to do something uh, will sign up. And I, I would recommend Moms of Man Action, but there are other groups that you can sign up uh, with as well. The great thing about Moms is that it's based upon local chapters. So, you know, you don't have to join a national group. You can join the local Moms chapter and you can do local advocacy or state-based advocacy. And what's great about all of these organizations, but Moms of Man Action in particular, is that you're also not required to um, you know, immediately spend 10 hours a week on advocacy, right. you'll be given a menu. And, you know, you can choose to be a really active volunteer, or you can choose to be somebody that, you know, just sort of gets the alerts and and and, and acts in response to those alerts. But, um, but they matter, right? They, they, they matter when that volume is raised of phone calls and emails. Yep. Um, at the critical moments at the, at the local, state and national level, that's what helps us get these laws passed. So um, joining the movement and, and joining it formally, like not just saying yep. you're part of the movement, but actually signing up with a group um, is really what, what helps us. And, and I just want to uh, say that we are mothers and others. Uh, we also have students demand action where we're men, women, non-moms, um, and, and we're going to be working very hard to support you and in, in your efforts in the Senate. So let's let's go to some of the questions we got from the audience over the weekend. Um, they're much more direct. So here's the first one. Why is America the only country where we need to worry about surviving a trip to the grocery store? Yeah. Yeah. And you talk about what we've become numb to. We've become numb to the risk uh, as uh, as well. We've become numb to the idea that our kids, you know, have to go through metal detectors when they, you know, walk into their into the into their school, um, as my son does when he you know goes to his middle school. Um, so why are we the only only country? Uh, well, that's a lot of the story of of the book, um, and it's a it's a story of racism, it's a story of poverty, and it's a story of guns. Um, the the three things that are kind of exclusive to America that drive the gun violence epidemic. We have permitted a level of poverty in this country that most other rich nations just don't allow. Most other rich nations just say we're just not going to let people sort of work 40 hours a week and not be able to put food on the table. America permits that for some reason. And poverty drives violence. Um, if you are poor in this country, you are more likely to be the victim of gun violence, domestic violence. You're more likely to be the victim of suicide. So uh, there's a direct correlation between economic desperation and violence. You got to solve that problem. Second, violence is used as a mechanism uh, to um, oppress racial groups. And, um, you know, unfortunately, we saw that last summer with the murder of George Floyd. If you don't sort of have a reckoning with racism in this country, then you're not going to be able to adequately attack violence. But then it's all predicated on access to weapons. It is just so much easier to get a weapon in this country than anywhere else. And so uh, disputes that in other countries would sort of end up in a verbal altercation, or maybe at worst in a fist fight, um, result in a gun murder in the United States. The story that opens my book um, is, a, is a murder that happens a block away from where I live in Hartford. Um, literally, it's a, it's a young guy dropping off a car that he's selling to somebody else. He's with his girlfriend. The guy that he's selling the car to makes a rude comment about his girlfriend. Um, a verbal altercation ensues, and there happens to be a gun in the front seat of one of these kids' cars. And instead of it just being a shouting match or a shoving match, the kid goes and gets the gun and fires shots. And at the end of it, this 20-year-old kid, Shane uh, Oliver, is, is dead. Um, that just doesn't happen anywhere else in the world because there's not a gun sitting in the front seat 
of some 20 year old's car in London or Tokyo or Paris because they don't have gun laws that allow for that to happen. Um, and, and that becomes a big, big difference that defines American gun violence. Well, and I think this goes into this next question we have for an audience member. We're also the only nation that has something no other high income country does, which is a gun lobby, a special interest that has become wealthy and powerful, or at least was, um, and was really writing at the table, writing our nation's gun laws. And, and so the question is, what is the real clout of the NRA now? Do they still have any left after their corruption and fraud allegations? Um, the NRA itself, you know, is a shell of its former self. Um, but um, what the NRA did very effectively over 20 years was to sort of make the, the to make the issue of guns um, a way for a candidate to communicate broader values. So um, I don't mean to get too sort of partisan here, but you know what's happened over the last 20 years is the Republican Party has kind of become a one-trick pony. They're just kind of like an anti-government party. They don't really have a lot of ideas other than we hate government. Well, what's the best way to sort of translate to your voters how much you hate government? Well, standing for the ability of the population to um, have guns so that they can engage in armed insurrection against the government. So in order to sort of translate how conservative and how much I hate government, I need to sort of show that I believe everybody should be able to have a gun so that they can arm themselves against government. Um, the NRA is not as big a force, um, but that, that, that sort of paradigm still exists for a lot of Republicans. A lot of Republicans are still fearful of sort of voting with us on guns because they think that's, that they'll lose a Republican primary because somebody will try to outflank them using guns as a sort of proxy for this broader set of anti-government values. Um, but it does matter that the NRA is not as powerful. And I'll tell you, when I'm talking to Republicans right now, and I was just talking to them on the floor of the Senate tonight about you know this compromise that we're trying to work out, they will volunteer to me. You know, Some of them will say to me, Republican senators will say, yeah, well, maybe this is the time to do it, you know, because the NRA, you know, they're just not calling me as much as they used to. Maybe now is the time to get it done. So it, it is impactful they, they have how to far ask their fallen. bankruptcy lawyers before they make long distance calls. They have to get those signed off. But don't you think, Shannon, I mean, when they, you know, they tried to, 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 to plant this article a couple of weeks back that they were they were engaging in a two million dollar ad yep. buy to stop my background checks negotiations were moving forward. And like, they thought that that was like a big deal. And I read that and I said, oh my God, the NRA only has $2 million. <laughs> That's it. That's all they have to spend. Like mom's demand action, you know, spends that in a day in the, in the, in the end of, of political campaign season. So it, that was a sign to me that they were pretty weak. Yeah. You know, I, I think that um, they have been pulled just like you remember when the Tea Party pulled Congress to the right, these these gun groups, both at a national, but mostly at a state level, every state has their own version of the NRA, and it's usually to the right of the NRA. They 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 were so pulled to the right, and I I really think if if they went back in time, after the the tragedy in Sandy Hook, when they had an opportunity to sort of just come to the middle and moderate on background checks, and if they had come to the table and said, yes, we can support this one thing. I don't know that you and I would be having this conversation right now. We might have packed up our bags and said, okay, our work here is done. But because they doubled down and because they have gone so far, they've become so extreme and so radicalized, not their members, their, their leaders, then they've, they've really put themselves in an untenable position, of course, on top of the corruption and all of the other issues. But you know, they don't represent mainstream America. They don't represent gun owners. Well, and a lot of their money is from the industry itself. I mean, the NRA has had all these innovative ways yeah. to, you know, get direct and indirect contributions from the gun industry. One thing they often work out is that sometimes when you buy a gun at a gun store, a portion of that sale gets donated directly to the NRA. So they're very tied to the sort of modern gun industry. And as you know, you know, the modern gun industry now is, um, you know, selling a lot of weapons to a small number of people. Um, only 3% of Americans own 50% yep. of the guns. And so um, those individuals, I mean, tend to be more radicalized um, in their views about government, for instance, uh, that 3% that are buying 20, 30 weapons. 
So given that that's where all the money is being made in the industry, that also forces the NRA, which is making its money off those sales, to become more radicalized as well. Um, because though you saw an uptick in 2020 in terms of the number of households in the country that have weapons, that number has been generally in rapid decline from 1980 yeah. until uh, until today. And that means that the industry now is relying on selling lots of expensive weapons to a small number of people. Senator, the next question is, does President Biden have any shot of getting meaningful gun safety reform done with a 50-50 Senate? And I, I assume they mean not just legislative. Well, you know, there is this conversation about whether we need to change the rules of the Senate. You know, maybe that's a topic for another time, but you can guess how I feel about this. I just don't understand why our democracy sort of stands in the way of the majority of people getting their way. Um, uh, 60 uh, votes, I do not think is, uh, is, is, is necessary, nor do I believe that our founding fathers would have accepted this extra impediment that the Senate has put in the way of legislation passing. So, you know, we have 50 votes in the Senate today for, um, you know, universal or near universal background checks. So my hope is that at some point we'll have a conversation about changing those rules and that will make all of our lives easier in the movement. Um, until then, as I mentioned at the outset, it is hard to get to 60 votes on universal background checks, but maybe we can find a compromise. Um, that being said, um, as folks probably know, Joe Biden isn't waiting for Congress. He has moved forward with a, a series of executive actions. One of them is really, really important. He is cracking down on these things called ghost guns. Ghost guns are, you know, guns that sort of show up to your house in a kit, not fully assembled, and then you put it together and it's a gun without a serial number and a gun that never went through a background check. Five years ago, these things were really fringy. They, they, they existed, but they, they weren't, you know, very widespread. Today, especially on the West Coast, for folks that are listening to this in Los Angeles, um, they are becoming the norm. Los Angeles police report that 40% of the guns that they're confiscating now are ghost guns. That's mm. extraordinary. Those are wholly unregulated guns, guns that never had a background check, guns that can't be traced. Biden is going to get rid of them. Biden is going to take them out of commercial circulation without a background check. He's going to basically say, if you want to sell a ghost gun, you've got to do it on the commercial market with a background check, with a serial number. Um, that's a really, really big deal because these are guns that are increasingly crime guns um, because they're secret guns. They're, 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 they're ghosted guns. And that executive order, which he doesn't need Congress for, arguably, um, is going to by itself save a lot of lives. And, and, and how about the ATF? How, how important do you think that is changing and having a director there? Yeah, so that, that's really, really important. So um, for, for most of the last 30 years, we have not had a director of the ATF. This is the, the regulatory agency that goes out, you know, for instance, and inspects gun stores to make sure that they're not selling you know, uh, under the counter to criminals. Uh, Republicans never, Republican presidents never, ever named an ATF director, and they spent a lot of time blocking ATF nominees from Democratic presidents. Um, uh, David Chipman, who's a former ATF um, uh, agent, uh, has been nominated by Joe Biden. He knows the ATF backwards and forwards. He respects gun owners, um, but he also is going to come after criminals, gun traffickers. And uh, his nomination is moving through the Senate. Um, it, it, nominees only need 50 votes. So Chipman is expected to have 50, maybe more votes in the Senate. Uh, and to have somebody at the head of ATF who's just enforcing the laws, you know, not playing politics, just enforcing the laws, going after the bad apple gun dealers, going after the gun traffickers, um, that um, that will also save a lot of lives because that'll just just shrink the space that the that the bad actors have to um, to, to sell guns domestically. And by the way, internationally, um, you know, we're dealing with this crisis at the border and um, a lot of the migration to the southern border is driven by violence in Mexico, for instance. Well, you know what? Mexican has one gun store. <laughs> All the guns in Mexico come from the United States. And the ATF, properly run, can crack down on this pipeline of guns that runs from the United States down to Mexico. And that will pay off um, when it comes to migration policy as well. Yep. Well, and, and speaking of, of policies, someone wants to know how your support of gun safety has influenced your overall view, uh, for example, national security or foreign aid, um, your opinion on the international affairs budget, budget. How has this sort of leaked into the other things that you work on as a senator? 
So I, I wrote a chapter in this book called The Violence We Export. And I think it's a really interesting chapter, but I admit that it sort of is a little bit of a square peg because it's much more about sort of the, the U.S. weapons industry and, and, and how we um, sort of export violence to the rest of the world. But I sort of thought it was necessary in writing a survey of the story of American violence to talk about the fact that America sends violence overseas. Part of that chapter actually talks about exactly how guns move from the United States down to Latin America. Um, but I tell another story in that chapter that I'll tell quickly here because it's kind of relevant to Joe Biden being overseas with our European partners. Um, early in 2013, I got a call from the U.S. ambassador to Britain, and he called me and he said, hey, you know, Chris, I got to tell you this story. Um, I go around to these schools in Britain and I give out two note cards to the classes that I'm speaking to. And on one note card, I ask them to write something that they like about the United States, just one word. And on the other note card, I asked them to write one word that describes something that frustrates them about the United States. And he said, I had to call you because I was shocked after I did this a couple of times. The same word keeps popping up on 70% of the cards in the latter category. You know what it is? And I thought, mm, is it Iraq? Is it spying? <laughs> what is it? And he says, Chris, it's guns. It's mm. guns. These British kids, what they know about America is that there's all this violence and we do nothing about it. And so they feel this separation from the United States because we seem to value hum human life differently than they do. Yeah. And I learned that it, it, it weakens us internationally when all of these countries look at our gun violence rates and think that we are inhumane in yeah. our unwillingness to deal with it. So it, 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 you have to talk about the sort of international component of gun violence because we send a lot of guns to the rest of the world, but our failure to deal with this also just makes us a, a weakened partner um, yep. when it comes to a lot of other countries that look at us very strangely because of our failure to intervene. I think we have time for one last question. Um, and since we have a legal organization co-sponsoring this, we should probably ask a question about the Supreme Court. Um, and they say it seems likely there's a 5-4, if not a 6-3 majority uh, to vote in, in favor of, of gun lobby supported um, rulings. Is there anything that can be done to, to limit the impact of a Supreme Court ruling on this issue? Well, it's very worrying the direction that the Supreme Court is heading in. Um, they are you know, right now considering a case um, about the restrictions that um, states can place on where and how you carry a weapon. Um, I don't know how they're going to rule, but I know a lot about the sort of history of gun laws in this country. And what I know is at our founding, as I mentioned, when the Second Amendment was being written, uh, there were states that actively regulated where you could and couldn't carry a weapon. And so it's perfectly in keeping with the Second Amendment for states to be able to regulate this. Um, what's, you know, maybe more sort of scary is the is the very sort of radical ideas that some of these new justices bring to the court. Uh, Amy Coney Barrett in particular, Amy Coney Barrett, when she was on the appellate court, had a ruling, wrote a dissent in a Second Amendment case in which she argued felons should be able to own guns in which she argued it was unconstitutional for Congress to prevent a felon from owning a gun. She further argued that it shouldn't be up to Congress or up to any legislative body to decide uh, who can and can't own a weapon, that that should be up to the courts. Um, that is scary in and of itself, that unelected judges are going to decide what felons can own guns and what can't. So we will see, um, you know, there may be a very damaging ruling coming down the pike, um, but there might be even more radical moves coming. It's just as another reason why we have to elect Congresses and Senates and presidents that are going to put, um, you know, moderate voices on the court uh, instead of these extreme voices. Thank you to both of you, um, Senator Murphy and Shannon Watts, for participating in today's program. Um, this is an example. It's the best example of why I still do writer's block after 25 <laughs> years. I so appreciate it. Um, this book, The Violence Inside Us, is a must read. I think you can see it. And Shannon's book, Fight Like a Mother, is just terrific on, on how to start a movement and how to start a successful activist movement. I recommend both of them. Um, go to our website to lead you to Chevaliers. There's a link to those books. And thank you so much. And Senator Murphy, like 
go make this happen already. <laughs> I uh, listen. I'm, I'm, I'm like I'm like looking at my texts as we speak because we're in the middle of these negotiations. I will just say it's so amazing to be with you, Andrew. Such a big fan of what you have have built through Writer's Block, and and grateful to be a return guest. And Shannon, um, you know, we're in this moment right now with a possibility, um, not a probability, but a possibility of getting a bill done because of the movement that uh, you have midwifed into existence. So great to be with you all tonight. Thanks for having me. Thank, Thank you. Thank you to be with you.